show that brings you happenings in the world of diplomacy and international relations, diplomatic affairs. We are live on Pan-African television every Saturday between the hours of 4 to 5 o'clock p.m. And you can also catch us on Facebook and YouTube. So we are streaming live on all our social media platforms. You can join us and get to be part of today's show by sharing your thoughts, views, contributions, anything regarding the many issues that we will be looking at on today's show. Like, just like we did last week, we are continuing, no, last two weeks rather. So last week we should have been here, but unfortunately we had to pave way for the NPP parliamentary primary, so we couldn't come your way. So we are continuing with our conversations. Yes, we are talking about a number of issues. Today in focus will be Africa's visa-free policy as part of the AU's agenda. And that's 2063 and also world leaders strategic interest in Africa I call it Africa for grabs and we also have the UK's decision to send asylum seekers to Rwanda we'll find out why and if that is very legitimate or not and of course the 78th United Nations General Assembly meeting had a collective call by African leaders as they discussed freedom in terms of economy, freedom, politically, and all kinds of freedom when it comes to the African continent. Leave Africa alone, let's partner and not aid. So we'll be delving into all of that. And I have with me two amazing experts who will be helping us delve into these issues one by one. With your help, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting conversation. I'll take a break when I come back. I'm going to introduce them to you, even though they are no strangers to this platform. Stick and stay with us. Right. Welcome back. The show is Diplomatic Affairs. My name is Harriet Nati. We are live. Join us from wherever you find yourself. Now, with me in the studios to help us do that discussion today, I have Professor Lord Mauko Yevuga. Professor Lord Mauko Yevuga is an Associate Professor of Political Economy and International Relations and also the immediate past Director of Academic Planning and Quality Assurance at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. Gimpa. Yes, he once tutored me. Yeah, so I'm happy to have my lecturer on the platform with me today. Prof, welcome to Diplomatic Affairs. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. And also helping us delve into these issues, the pleasant and the no, not so pleasant, um, is Farouk Al-Wahab. Um, <laughs> Farouk has over 30 years of experience training diplomatic leaders, corporate leaders, and government protocol officials, primarily in Africa. This globally certified and experienced diplomatic and investment or international consultant is an expert in international relations, Africa, or world politics and government. Farouk, send us well. It's good to have you on Diplomatic Affairs. I'm blessed. Thank you. Mauko, Wezo. All right. Mijoa. Okay, let's begin. Now, I'm just going to take this, a bit of um, the background stories, mm -hmm. then we will go straight into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about a very sensitive issue. Today, when I put my, <laughs> my stories out there, I had all kinds of reactions. World leaders' strategic interest in Africa. Mm -hmm. 
high profile visits. Now, the flurry of visits by top figures in the world reflects a growing awareness that the world seeks to deepen its engagements with the African continent. The year 2023 has witnessed some high profile visits to Africa, such as the US Vice President Kamala Harris, French President Emmanuel Macron to Africa, not necessarily Ghana, Russian Foreign Minister um, Sergei Lavrov, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, um, Ukrainian Foreign Minister. All these high profile or chief diplomats visited Africa, visited Ghana and visited neighboring countries. Some also visited other parts of Africa and you know there were a lot of transactions there. For me I'd like to find out what really does this mean for Africa? Mm. How strategic it appears the West has a strategy in place with mm. regard to what they want with mm. Africa. Mm. But do we also have a plan? How do you, from where you sit, I'll start with Malko, from mm. where you sit, mm. how would you say this play out when mm. it comes to um, diplomatic terms or international relations? We need each other. No country, they say, can develop on mm. its own. Nobody is an island. Mm. How does this play out? Well, Harriet, thank you and thanks for having us uh, to go over these issues. Uh, I'm happy to be here, Farouk, once again. <laughs> uh, I mean, you talk about strategic uh, relations. Mm -hmm. I would think that um, when we talk about international relations, we're talking about strategy and interest. So, first of all, if other countries are coming to Africa, mm. they are not here on a holiday. <laughs> On they a vacation? No, not at all. They are here for strategic interest. And historically, that has been the way international relations play out. I mean, you need to... So it's nothing new mm. that they are coming to Africa. They've been doing that uh, always for various strategic reasons. Mm. So you are, to your question as to whether or not we are also ready, do we also have a strategy? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the issue we should be discussing. Because, you see, like I said, it's not, new, it's not a new thing that... Uh, foreign leaders who come to Africa, they want to engage Africa. Mm -hmm. If you remember, in early 2000s mm. onwards, from early 2000s, mm -hmm. we had this new crop of leaders, Obasanjo, Abdullah Wad, uh, Kufo, and others. They were being invited to the G7, mm -hmm. G8, those days. Mm -hmm. And the high point was the Glen Eagles in Scotland, where they were going to announce this big aid uh, intervention for Africa. Then the NEPAD the new African Economic Partnership for African Development was also outdoor. The G8 had African leaders. Mm -hmm. And people are talking about African Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Things are going to go different. What happened? It died out. It died out because we didn't have strategy to sustain those engagements mm -hmm. in our geopolitical interest. The world leaders, they, they are playing the long game. They know what they can get from Africa. Mm -hmm. They will not be here if they didn't know that they can get something from the continent. So as to whether or not we as a people have the same strategic uh, agenda, mm -hmm. that's something I'm not sure about. So they may come, they may engage us, they, we might even go to their countries for various summits. Mm -hmm. Italy just had the African summit, and Portu Portugal had had their, France had had their. They have all this because they want to position themselves in the continent because of the emergence of powers like China, India, Brazil. Mm -hmm. So the Western powers are ca catching up, and they are doing that very fast. What can we do as a continent? I think that's the issue that we as a, a continent with our leaders, we should be discussing. Before you can engage people, you need to have a plan. Mm. I mean, you can have your agenda 20, whatever. If you don't have a plan towards achieving that agenda, mm -hmm. it will come to pass and nothing will happen. Because Africa had had various opportunities to, to make the best out of this engagement. We haven't truly really done that. Mm. When NEPAD was, was outdoor as part of the, the whole transformation of the African Union, Everybody thought that this is going to be a game changer right. because African leaders were making um, a claim that we are going to move away from the old ways of doing things. Now we are going to be partners. Mm. And the whole discourse about partnership emerged as a new way Africa will relate to the rest of the world. Mm. As to whether or not that partnership agenda has worked, I mean, the jury is out. So for me, I'm not, I'm not so optimistic. Mm. Because it's one of those things that happen mm -hmm. and something else comes up and it dies out. Right. So we live to see. Well, according to Professor Mao Koyebuga, this is business as usual. Yeah. All right. Now, let, let me come to you, Farouk. What's your opinion, I mean, regarding this particular subject? 
<laughs> Africa. Some people have termed it Africa for grabs. And um, the point is, you cannot fault your other, um, your partner or the other party for having a plan in place, for being strategic, for having a blueprint to work with. What about you? If you do not have a blueprint, or are we not um, in a place that we can also call the shot? Is it what it is, really? It, it can be very dicey. You can explain to, for, for us to understand how it works in the layman's language. Okay. Let's look at it from this point that the 56 African countries, mm -hmm. They have individual destiny, and then they are, they are accountable for their own decisions that they make. Right. When it comes sovereign to states. sovereign states, and then with sovereignty rights, mm. when it comes in terms of uh, uh, decision as to which country that they should receive visitors from, on the reasons or the underlying subject of the engagement mm. as they are inviting or they are coming. Don't forget that the world leaders security council members permanent mm -hmm. the superpowers the uk the france the 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 americans and then the chinese and then also uh, russia, russia etc yeah. all of them yeah. at this point are looking for mm -hmm. which country to align themselves with mm -hmm. most of them are political issues mm -hmm. politically related mm -hmm. now there's ukraine war mm -hmm. then ukraine those countries that are aligned or assigned to ukraine Western. They want Africa also to be in support of whatever decisions that they are taking. Mm. Some of them goes unilateral, some of the multilateral decisions, mm. etc. But with regards to the high profile visit that are coming here, one would ask, mm -hmm. as Prof has already intimated, is that the first time? Answer is no. no. Mm. We've been having such visits, mm. i.e., look at where and how they choose and pick mm. the countries that they will they zone and then visit. Yeah. You made mention of Kamala. Mm. Kamala, U.S. Vice President, was in Accra. Mm. If one would summarize it all, the pressure and then the most, the most vocal point that she came with was the LGBTQ+. Yeah. Mm. So ironically, that should tell you that mm. they came with certain motives, mm. either bilateral, diplomatic, or political, or just normal world politics as such. Right. Each one of them goes on a visit. Mm. If you see a Russian a foreign minister, mm. Sergei Lavrov, mm. is coming anywhere in Africa mm. before until Ukraine war, mm. business as usual, mm. how Russia is getting closer, mm. that is when that led to the Sochi mm. uh, conference mm. or Sochi summit, calling all the Africans. Soon as Russia finished, China called them. Soon as Fra China finished, uh, France called them. Right. Soon as France and, and, finished, and I have a video that will play, will play yeah, to this particular yeah, issue yeah, that you raised. Yes. They call them. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? When you go to China, they give them a fine hotel. Mm -hmm. They put every gift. You can ask the leaders that go. That I said. They put them gift in their bedrooms, etc. Mm -hmm. Just as a sign of Chinese traditional welcome. Mm -hmm. Some are full. Some are nice alcoholic package. Blah, 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 blah. What are they seeking? France, uh, the, the, the Chinese are not friends with anybody. Mm -hmm. Chinese are friends with people who want to do business with them. Mm -hmm. That is all, because they've not been all out part of the Western mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. because they were branded as communist. So there's and always an interest. Of course. That is what I'm trying to drive up. Mm -hmm. That it has to do with an interest. Why and when they have to, which countries they choose and pick. Now when it comes back to Africa, mm -hmm. then we don't have, we should not see the continent as one country. It's supposed to be ideally mm -hmm. and a country mm -hmm. to be seen as one organization mm -hmm. like when you hit europe now mm -hmm. and it's european you know all of them come mm -hmm. africa till today regardless let's look out then let us not look at who is you or, mm -hmm. is you, mm -hmm. or any of the blocks mm -hmm. it is not true mm -hmm. when it comes to self decision the countries in africa here always till today take individualistic mm -hmm. unilateral decision to engage with the west mm -hmm. that is where we find ourselves always in a different lesson. Mm -hmm. Because whilst Ghana is talking to America over this, mm -hmm. you will find out that Algeria is also having a different discussion with the That's American right. people. Mm -hmm. So the whites, let me not put it in the Western, they choose and pick strategically mm -hmm. what they are going after every other, other country. Mm -hmm. Because they know that the decision is not coming from the African Union, mm -hmm. but the decision is mm -hmm. coming from the individual mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So they can engage them privately. Let me call it private talks. Mm -hmm. So all this high profile visit, it does not in any way benefit africa as a continent mm -hmm. it does either benefit the individual country mm -hmm. which most of them mm -hmm. they normally handle they do mm -hmm. bad negotiations mm -hmm. but because it's handled at one country level mm -hmm. so whether they have the expertise mm -hmm. the courage the wisdom 
and then the technicality and even the understanding. Mm -hmm. How do you think that when a Congress of American investors sit now and have a vis a vis engagement with Gambia, mm -hmm. would it, how do you think mm -hmm. how many experts are in Gambia in terms of this international trade, etc.? Mm -hmm. They'll bulldoze through them. Mm -hmm. But they cannot go that they cannot go and do that in Morocco mm -hmm. or Egypt or South Africa. So every country by country basis, they go out there with a specific need. need. Mm -hmm. And, and we, they, all, we all have peculiar needs. And they tailored those particular needs mm -hmm. before they do presentation. The countries who said that, well, to hell with African Union stand. Mm -hmm. I'll grab it mm -hmm. and go my way. Mm -hmm. So if you put it collectively, mm -hmm. it doesn't really, really matter mm -hmm. the worst thing that they are coming, the African for grab. Yes, we are for grab because we are naive mm -hmm. till today. Mm -hmm. We have pushed, positioned ourselves be, uh, out of, to show that kind of naivety. But it's supposed not to be the case because if we have an organization that binds us, binds us together but, but since we do 19. Have an organization, yes, of course, but we AU. It exists. As, you know, oh, okay. imagine. I didn't know about that. We do have the African Union, which is supposed <laughs> to be a pact for Africa, all yes. the African Perfect. countries. 1963. Right? Spearheading the interest of yeah, the continent. Yeah, 1963. Right. Why, why do you, I don't cut you short here, why do you allow, as we're talking about, Russia comes and go out there to Togo and negotiate Togo on their own strength with Togo privately and go. America comes to Ghana and negotiate with LGTBQ plus and go. Then also um, uh, UK, they will go to uh, Zimbabwe mm -hmm. that, okay, Mugabe out. Now we can deal with you and then negotiate with them and leave. What are we talking about here? What they've done with Togo, does it really resonate? Does it even, 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 is that the, the will? of the African Union collectively, mm -hmm. when it comes even in the five regions of the African continent, the North, the East, the West, the Central, and then the South. Is that how it plays in? Each of the block even have a different thing prof that they do. Mm -hmm. ECOWAS have their laws and etc. The Central African Republic, the Eastern right. African Republic, the SADAC regions. All of them have but, different things. But one would also argue that they are operating on the back of sovereignty, as stated earlier. Exactly. Of right? It means you have the freedom to decide to go for what you want, to do whatever you want to do with the country. And I uh, said that, just as Farouk said, if you take the European Union, yes. when the, the issue affects them as a collective, mm -hmm. they take a collective EU Deci decision. decision. So decision. if we in Africa are saying that the African Union mm -hmm. is the collective organ for all of us, then, like he's saying, it doesn't make sense for us to be negotiating mm -hmm. as countries. You know, when you decide to join regional bodies, you are ceding part of your sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And that's what Kwame Nkrumah said. Yes. You have to be willing to cede part of your, of your sovereignty mm -hmm. so that the collective interest will, 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 will take root. But we are not doing that. And one other thing, you see, the, the, the Western powers, they know the divisions that exist on the continent. Mm -hmm. For example, the Francophone, Anglophone mm -hmm. divide. Yeah. And they explore that. We all saw on TV how even the, the Pan-African Parliament, they couldn't even agree to elect a speaker because the, the two blocks, Francophone, Anglophone, had a different approach to doing it. Some say, let's do rotation. Some say, let's do voting. And whilst they are doing that, you know, the superpowers are enjoying it because it's the part of the old uh, game that yes. divide and root strategy they adopted mm. during the colonial mm. period. Mm. They still do that because they know the African uh, people Canada. or the countries cannot come together on one particular issue. So they play us and they divide us against each other. So at the end of the day, like he said, you have the African Union mm. with an agenda, right. yet they know that they can get away dealing with the individual countries. How come that, you look at the West African sub-region, we are having these military leaders who are now saying they are no, part, no longer part of ECOWAS. Yes. If they don't have any support from somewhere, they wouldn't do that. Exactly. They, if they don't have anybody supporting them, they wouldn't take that decision. Uh, do they really need support from anywhere else to take that decision? Oh, they it's do about, need. It's about me, survival. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's about survival, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that maybe they think that they don't really benefit. There aren't any benefits from you know, Africa, well, which they is play, see, why they would rather want to stay on their own yeah, but instead we can't of joining be, we can't the be naive continental about the, the superpower rivalry. We all know the Wagner group from Russia has been part and parcel of this Sahel region. And we saw some of the fighters from Central Africa, Burkina Faso. Even Burkina Faso is willing to invite them into their country. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have those assurances, how, why are they sacking the French from their various countries? And they've sacked them they, indeed. Yeah. They've succeeded in sacking yeah, them. Yeah, why would they do that? 
Okay, very interesting. All right, we'll leave it here. Um, <laughs> we don't. We are always, um, you know, um, time. But, but yeah, exactly. But today we'll do our best to make sure that we cover all the stories that we have mentioned on the show. Like I said, we have our numbers on your screen and you can also join in and be part of the conversation. would like to hear from you what you think about all the topics that we have enlisted here. Now, let, let's talk about um, the UK government's decision to to send um, asylum seekers to Rwanda. There's another interesting twist in diplomatic terms or international relations. You know, on April 14, 2022, the UK government officially announced that it is going to send people who arrive in the UK to seek asylum to the Republic of Rwanda. Now, but the UK Supreme Court declared the policy unlawful because Rwanda was not a safe country to remove asylum seekers to. The High Court ruled on 19 December 2022 that the policy was lawful. This was appealed to the Court of Appeal, which ruled by a majority of two judges to the one to the policy was unlawful. But they debated the policy. That's the whole issue. And it appears now there is a consensus. We've agreed. I think this is a move that we would want to take as a country. This is in the interest of the UK. Asylum seekers. Prof, when we talk about asylum seekers, mm. who is an asylum seeker? Oh, asylum seeker is somebody who, for a, a variety of reasons, uh, is seeking a refuge in another country. It could be political persecution. It could be e academic. It could be economic. economic. Yeah, it could be anything that is driving somebody from his country of origin mm. to another country. Mm looking for either a better life, mm. safety, a boat, or whatever. So there are different reasons why people will go seeking asylum in another country. Internationally, it's been part and parcel of international relations. People are moving from one place to another. Except that whether or not the country you are seeking is mm. willing to accept you. That's what become a debatable issue. But as to people looking for safety, safe places to go mm. to, it's been part and parcel of uh, human... Um, Kind of relations. Is yeah. this lawful? What, which one is lawful? The no, decision no. by the UK government to send asylum seekers to um, a third world country. Okay. Is this lawful? Let me find out mm -hmm. that then again, mm -hmm. we ask the African Union mm -hmm. their position on this subject. Yes. Because the fact that is UK trying to tell me and tell you and I mm -hmm. that if somebody is on the border of Rwanda, mm -hmm bordering with Uganda, mm. and the person is a Ugandan asylum seeker. Mm. Now, now, what UK is telling Ugandan asylum seekers that don't even come to London, but then enter mm -hmm. Rwanda and seek asylum, mm -hmm. and then it's UK government that will take care of you. Mm. It's called completely mm -hmm. something that I can't even understand yeah. how. Then again, we claim we have African Union. Mm -hmm. Then again, you, Rwanda alone sat down mm -hmm. with the UK mm -hmm. and agreed, mm -hmm. which in any case, should not be because who are the UK sending down? Mm -hmm. The UK has territorial areas around the world. Mm -hmm. The Pacific is there. Mm -hmm. Free land. Mm -hmm. West Papua is there. Mm -hmm. Samoa Island, mm -hmm. Nauru Island, mm -hmm. Noe Island, mm -hmm. Micronesia, mm -hmm. Polynesia. We have Vanuatu. All these islands are there, free. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if UK indeed mm -hmm. wants a place mm -hmm. that to put asylum seekers, one, I haven't seen the agreement, but if the agreement suggests that they will be there as asylum seekers mm -hmm. in the pocket and the cost mm -hmm. of the UK, mm -hmm. then I'm suggesting that they could have taken them to the Caribbean mm -hmm. because already mm -hmm. you are not only taking African asylum seekers, that is not what the subject seeks to mm -hmm. do, to say. Mm -hmm. It's asylum seekers collectively. It means that if somebody from Poland mm -hmm. has seek political asylum in UK, right. they think mm -hmm. that that person would agree and now come to Rwanda. Yeah. What is the UK talking about? The security is an issue. There is an African where we don't have, let's say I'll call it, our laws are, are debatable, mm -hmm. our laws are challengeable mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is wanted in Guinea mm -hmm. and he has gone to UK mm -hmm. to seek political asylum, his political refugee, mm -hmm. right. then you bring him to Rwanda. Rwanda has a law of extradition between Rwanda mm -hmm. and, then, and then Guinea. Mm -hmm. yep. Therefore, Guinea now sees that, oh, we are looking for Traoré, mm -hmm. and Traoré is now in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Then Rwanda, please, mm -hmm. we want Traoré. Let us go back into our mm -hmm. law of extradition pact between the two of us. Mm -hmm. Release him to me. Is that what the UK is seeking? Mm -hmm. UK, Germany, 
other countries of the world, including the United States and Ghana, have signed as part of human rights and part of the Charter Protocols Agreement with the United Nations mm -hmm. that asylum, whether the person is telling the truth or not, mm -hmm. whether economic or political or whether military or whichever, mm -hmm. You must hear the person out, grant them a place to stay, and that is what Canada has been doing mm -hmm. as an immigrant city mm -hmm. or country. Mm -hmm. Let us hear you out. Three years we are going to investigate your case. Mm -hmm. If otherwise, then we bring you back that you don't have an issue. Now, UK is putting all of them. Are they going to select African asylum seekers mm -hmm. and bring them to Rwanda? Mm -hmm. Or they are seeking all over. Then let's just not make mistake. Mm -hmm. The biggest asylum seekers in UK are not the Africans. Mm -hmm. The Pakistanians are there. Mm -hmm. Are you getting me? Yeah. The Indians, and most of them are still asylum seekers in UK. Mm -hmm. What about other countries of the world? Mm -hmm. What about the Asians? What about Arabian countries, the Arabian Peninsula? Mm -hmm. UK that has a lot of, let's say, terrorist asylum seekers lodging in UK. Are we saying that, yes, Africans are free by thinking and taking into consideration that we don't have that kind of sophisticated security mm -hmm. to control them, mm -hmm. more or less vis-a-vis. -vis. Mm -hmm. If they are in Rwanda, Rwanda is not, like you made mention, Rwanda is still... They don't have democracy, they have economic the, the, democracy. These issues have been raised. They have economic democracy. Right. Mm -hmm. He has done well, he has done his country, he has managed well. Mm -hmm. For me, yes, he has stayed in power, but he hasn't got the opposition. Mm -hmm. Well, so, let, let me just mention, mm -hmm. let me just mention, but, just to state the fact that yes. the Supreme Court raised three main issues mm -hmm. regarding this, um, mm -hmm. the country's poor human rights record, mm -hmm. you know, and they also mentioned the presence of serious and um, systematic defects in its asylum processing, mm -hmm. and that's under a similar agreement with Israel. Rwanda removed asylum seekers to countries of origin. So these mm -hmm. asylum seekers, mm -hmm. they are countries of origin, mm -hmm. which is, which violates, you mm -hmm. know, the principle mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but like he said, you see, so what, what is African Union's position on this? You see, here we are, we say we are a united continent. And you know, there are sensitive issues about colonialism and neocolonialism. Some time ago, Australia was doing similar policy mm -hmm. where they were taking people seeking asylum to some island mm -hmm. uh, nearby Papua New Guinea. So it's been done before. Yeah, it's and, been and done that, before. But they stopped. A new they government, stopped. the government came to power. They campaigned against that and they won the elections and they stopped because there are a lot of human rights abuse issues involved. If somebody is seeking asylum to come to your country, you either grant it or you don't grant it. By taking the person to a third country against their wish. Against their wish. The person, I didn't intend to go to Rwanda. <laughs> I want to go to the UK. You either accept in the UK or you say I should go back to my country of origin. That is why the fact that even in the UK, their own people have serious issues about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, ministers have lost their positions because of that. And the government is unpopular, highly unpopular because of this. So how come that we as a country, we haven't had that debate? The African Union haven't had that debate. And what they will ask Rwanda to come and explain what informed their decision to agree to this. Because but Rwanda doesn't need the permission. No, they are part of the, 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 the African Union. Union. And I just mentioned that because of the historical issues about colonialism and mm. neocolonialism, mm -hmm. any such thing is very sensitive matter. And if Rwanda wants to be true to its uh, role as a member of the African Union, they should not be taking such decisions single-handedly. Mm. Because it has image problems for the African continent. Because now we are aiding the UK in a way to perpetuate human rights abuse. That is what their own people are saying, that this is about human rights. So Rwanda could be cited for enabling the UK to do that. Let me even add yeah. also yeah. something to mm -hmm. Prof. Mm -hmm. European Union, mm -hmm. Italy, mm -hmm. and then Greece, mm -hmm. and then Spain, Lampedusa mm -hmm. in Italy, mm -hmm. Gran Canaria in mm -hmm. Spain, and then also mm -hmm. Athens in Greece. Mm -hmm. These countries have been the entry point of the mostly asylum seekers from the North Africa, mm. that is from West all over, as mm. we know. Mm. Now, when Italians started, they tried to imprison or put them in detention. Okay. It is not Italy mm. standing on you that this is Italian security, sovereignty, and sovereign, blah, blah, blah. No. European Union went in and mm. stepped in that you cannot do that. Mm. Allow them. Mm. And the European Union will take decisions mm. which countries will decide to absorb or take some of them. Mm. In 1992, when there was a breakaway Republic of Yugoslavia, mm. 
Mm. When Slovakia, uh, Slovenia, mm. uh, Dubrovnik, Sarajevo, Croatia, uh, how do we call it, Albania, Kosovo, Tirana, all these were breaking away in 1991, mm. after the Yugoslavian war. Mm. The first entry was Germany. Mm. The second entry or the first entry was Austria. Mm. That had border mm. in Magdeburg with Graz. Mm. So when all these people have entered, they entered to other destinations of European Union. Mm. Swiss decided they have to take them. Even though they were not part of the European Union, but all of them decided to take the numbers. Mm. Here we are today. Mm. So UK, you cannot take refugees. Mm. And then you take the refugees. You are telling me now that if I'm a, let's say, I'm a perceived or I'm a, an asylum seeker. Mm -hmm. Now I fly to London. Mm. I fold my arms. London sees me in an aircraft and bring me to Rwanda. Mm. What next? Mm. Are you getting me? What are they yeah. going to do in Rwanda? Uh, uh, Harriet, you see, what is striking about this? You know, when the war broke out between Russia and Ukraine, or when Russia invaded Ukraine, mm. yes. you know, UK and other Western countries were accepting refugees from Ukraine, willingly, all over. All over. They are begging families, if you agree to accommodate a uh, Ukrainian mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. they give you some mm -hmm. financial reward. They were doing that. So it, it raises the question, you are willing to take these people, yet people who are seeking asylum for one reason or another, you are not willing to take them. So what is the UK's excuse for doing that? You are willing to take refugees, and you took refugees from Syria. Syria, Syria many of them. are in the UK. And then Ukraine. The Ukrainian refugees. So you are taking accepted. all of them. These ones, you can accept them. But people mo coming mostly from Africa. Africa and mostly your yeah, colonial, can, your yeah, colonial exactly. countries. You are sending them to... It doesn't add up. If, if UK were to say that, look, we are saturated in terms of population, mm -hmm. we can't take anybody, they should cut across. It should, it should be uniform, but you can't be taking some people willingly and others you are sending them to a third country. And that's what I'm saying, that there are historical and new colonial tendencies in this arrangement. Mm -hmm. You understand? Right. Is, is money involved? Yes, of, of course. course. So let's talk about the incentive. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about the money. The incentives involved. are always there. There are a lot of incentives. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that I myself sitting here. Mm -hmm. I've been a mission translator. Mm -hmm. I've been translated at Transkirk in the biggest refugee camp mm -hmm. in Austria in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I've been a translator in Asin Hüchtenstadt in Germany, in Chemnitz and Leipzig. So when you talk about refugee issues and refugee mm. understanding mm. of some of these things, mm. countries do not just because they have money to spend. Mm. Of course, nobody declares how much mm. comes into the country in mm. terms of benefits, mm. but no country will just set up. And then if you are accepting refugees, they are what comes with it. Mm. But then on the flip side, some governments in Europe, especially the far right, or the center left or the center right parties for instance they do that to play politics because the point is that a country like syria a country like ukraine that has a special need or a special issue of indeed a genuine asylum applications are granted if they are granted into the system refugee granted asylum granted it takes them three years for them to be a national mm -hmm. or take them to be a citizen of that country. Mm -hmm. What is he seeking to do? What it means is that if it is the, let's say in the case of Germany, is the mm -hmm. CDU or SPD, in the case of UK, is the Labour Party or Conservative Party mm -hmm. that really took these refugees. If within a matter, you've taken about almost close to about 200, 300,000 refugees, mm -hmm. and then they are all becoming nationals of that country in three years, where are they? The allegiance with the party that gave them mm -hmm. the passport and the asylum status. So they use that to play politics. Stephen Harper did it in Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Justin uh, Trudeau is doing that, mm -hmm. and it's all over like, like that. America played the same politics. Mm -hmm. Who allowed the, the Latinos, mm -hmm. the Mexicanas mm -hmm. to enter? Mm -hmm. So during the time that they become citizens of the United States, if it is a, mm -hmm. if it is a, 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 a American Republican, mm -hmm. all of them, they say that, okay, mm -hmm. it's Republican that granted. Till today, Ghanaians that haven't uh, asylum, and they have the asylum granted and nationality citizenship granted. Mm -hmm. Under Reagan, mm -hmm. most of them will say that mm -hmm. the allegiance or they have a soft spot for Republican, well, regardless of the fact. Right. So it is very, very very these program. are the, right. some of the external mm -hmm. benefits mm -hmm. or incentives, mm -hmm. apart from the economic incentive, mm -hmm. the money that the United Nations mm -hmm. and the World Refugee Fund give to them, and other donor countries. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. Remember, Harriet, before we, uh, we go we on this topic, mm -hmm. you see, it's good that we are having this conversation mm -hmm. because I think that in our country we don't have these conditions enough. You remember a few years ago when the Guantanamo Bay yeah. were sent to Ghana? Yes. Well, you they, see the, the national black, uh, backlash about mm -hmm. how the government didn't consult even the opposition. 
and now it has died down. Right. Here we are, our own continent, we're having this issue. And I don't see the African people discussing this issue. You understand? Mm. Because today it may be Rwanda doing that. Mm. Tomorrow another country may be doing that. Mm -hmm. Because when Ghana did it, the people in government now, they were in opposition at the time, mm. they didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need to speak up about mm. some of these things as Africans. Because it's our continent. It is yeah, our yeah, continent. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, let's move on. Now, okay, so let's talk about the 78th United Nations General Assembly meeting in mm. New York, mm. where we have global leaders um, convening every year to discuss mm. issues of global interest. African leaders are relaying a unanimous message that their continent of more than 1.3 billion people is done being a victim of a post world war order and must be recognized and partnered with as a global power in itself. I have some clips that I'm going to play um, to back our discussion right here in the studio. I don't know why you are nodding your head. I don't know why you're looking we at me want like to that. Listen to but you know what? Mind. If we have those clips ready, let's take them and we'll come back. We'll come back into the studio. overdue to correct the long-standing injustice that the current structure and composition of the United Nations Security Council represent for the nations of Africa. After serving on the Council at this difficult time in the world, our views on the need for reform have been even more strongly reasserted. We cannot continue to preach democracy, equality, and good governance around the globe. We cannot insist on, insist on peace and justice in the world when our global organization is seen by the majority of its members and the people of the world as hampered by an unjust and unfair structure. Mr. President, the Assembly has quite properly chosen the rebuilding of trust as critical in restoring stability and prosperity to our world. We cannot rebuild that trust when the organization that should bind us is seen by many as helping to perpetuate an unfair world order, which is reinforced by an inequitable, dysfunctional global financial architecture. Moments like now place the nature and purpose of multilateralism under sharp scrutiny for history's honest examination and judgment. If any confirmation was ever needed that the United Nations Security Council is dysfunctional, undemocratic, non-inclusive, unrepresentative, and therefore incapable of delivering meaningful progress in our world as presently constituted, the rampant impunity of its actors on global scene settles that matter. The environment of pervasive mistrust between the global north versus the global south, developed versus developing, rich versus poor, polluters versus victims, and net emitters versus net victims, which complicate and frustrates multilateralism is the inevitable result of promises not kept, commitments not actualized, resolutions not honored, and principles not observed. Multilateralism has been failed by abuse of trust, negligence, and impunity. A year ago, I stood in this assembly hall to call upon the global community to transform the UN system in order to achieve a consensus-driven, rules-based multilateral system which works for the people of the world in their diversity. It is time for multilateralism to reflect the voice of the farmers, represent the hopes of villagers, champion the aspirations of pastoralists, defend the rights of fisher folk, express the dreams of traders, respect the wishes of workers, and indeed protect the welfare of all peoples of the world. The 20 climate hotspots in the world that we have we find 17 of them in Africa. Africa is least responsible for the climate damage that has been caused 
and yet it bears the greatest burden. Centuries after the end of the slave trade, decades after the end of the colonial exploitation of Africa's resources, the people of our continent are once again bearing the cost of industrialization of the North and the development of the wealthy nations of the world. This is a price that the people of Africa are no longer prepared to pay. Many countries in the North count their assets in the mineral resources that are beneath the African soil. The wealth of Africa belongs to Africans. The mineral wealth that is beneath the soil of Africa must, in the end, accrue to Africans. We urge global leaders to accelerate the global decarbonization while pursuing equality and shared prosperity. Right, so, um, yeah, those were some African leaders yeah. at the United Nations um, 78th General Assembly meeting in New York um, expressing their displeasure yeah. at the exploitation yeah. which goes on on the continent. So yes, um, I'm sure you had the tape, you watched yeah. the video, and um, it's, it's nice to see yeah. our leaders mounting yeah. the podium yeah, and nice. speaking out loud yeah. and speaking about issues yeah. that concern Africa, the yeah. exploitation of our continent, yeah. the minerals and all of that. We want to be liberated economically, mm. Mm. not just politically. Farouk, I'll start with you. Whether you saw President Nanaro yes. Dankwe yes. um William Ruto, yes. and, and then Sarah Ramaphosa. Right, Sarah Ramaphosa. Beautiful. Mm. Let us not, let's, let's, let's applause Ghana for all the time. Mm. We are the first African country uh, to speak on the U, the UNGA, mm. UN General Assembly, so it's very good. Mm. The English, very clear. Mm. Ruto William, who's a friend, mm. very nice English. Cyril Ramaphosa, the same thing. The business is always the same. The, the, the complaint mm -hmm. is always the same. The talk is always the same. You went there as a country, we went there as Africans. So here they are speaking Africa. Mm. Then we are asking that 1963, the agenda of the Africans putting the African continent together and called something called OAU. Mm. And then leading that to 2002 made it African Union, mm. which in any case the name doesn't change anything. What have been the stand? Is that not the same thing, blaming colonization, Afroism, colonizing, and then etc. new colonizing? It is the same complaint that comes on the UNGA, UN General Assembly. It's the same thing. Whether being exploited, being cheated, being etc. How far have we packaged ourselves as a continent, as one unified front, that to today we are complaining, whereas countries, even in the western of Europe, a Germany that had a part called the East Germany in 1990 didn't know how to use WC, talk less of how to flash WC. And today, it's one of the it is beautiful and more developed than the West. Talk less of talking about a country like Romania, that any Romanian seen in Europe in the 90s was seen as a refugee. Bulgarian was a refugee. Poland was a refugee. Hungarians were refugees. Anybody you met in Europe at the time, in the just 90s, they didn't have anything called independence, talk less of having anything of freedom, liberty, economic liberty. Today, they joined a bloc called European Union. So now Estonia can say that, yes, we've also arrived. Lithuania can say, I've arrived. Slovenia that went into war have arrived. Croatia beautifully positioned and beautifully sent, cleared with economic prosperity. So these individual countries come to the same podium with you. They are not complaining. Mm -hmm. Our leaders are complaining about how many countries, 56 countries, because collectively, I even always have my, 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 my challenge that we allow the English presidents only to speak. That's why the French, the French, they warn them that when you come to UN General Assembly, mm -hmm. they don't call Benin president to speak, they don't call Togo president to speak, they don't call Mauritania president. It's always either Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, or Kenya. Setu, that's all. So now, they are speaking for Africa. 
if we are speaking for Africa, then go back and sit at the African African Union. Mm -hmm. You have the Congress of the body. Then you should now interface. Because when it comes to anything that goes through the United Nations, mm -hmm. either selecting Secretary General for uh, UNICEF, UNDC, etc., the same Africans go out there and vote for them. Mm -hmm. Then they come back to sit and complain. What are we complaining about? How long do we have to go through this? If smaller countries of Europe today has economic prosperity, you, you do have the resources. Mm -hmm. You have the mineral resources. Your population is bigger than them. Ghana population of 35 million is bigger than Luxembourg, uh, uh, Belgium, and then Holland combined. Yet you go to them and borrow. It's the same thing like Gambia, it's the same thing like other countries. But let's find out, Harriet, if any African country has ever benefited from one African country in terms of loan or facility or grant, let's see when Togo, Ghana gave credit to Togo. And I've said and I've mentioned that if we have a strong African Union that we are all propagating for emancipation, economic emancipation, mm -hmm. freedom, etc. Ghana was looking for $3 billion. Where was the African Union? So what is all this talk show about? We went to the IMF. You went to the IMF. Mm -hmm. So Nigeria hasn't got uh, $3 billion. South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, Johannesburg uh, uh, Joburg, their budget is more than $3 billion. Mm -hmm. It's more than the 15 to $20 billion. It's even uh, far less. So they couldn't have called. Ramaphosa couldn't call. Nana Bidanko Kufaduda, please don't take your plate and bow and go to IMF. Please come here as a brother. So we don't have an African Union that has put a fund. That, that fund is for countries in distress. Mm -hmm. Whereas Europe, when uh, 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 Greece were in distress, Germany took care and paid their salary for six uninterrupted months mm -hmm. with their SS budget. Mm -hmm. So if all this, all the time, this is a, it's a deja vu. We've had this history. Yeah. We were taught in school, mm -hmm. Africans and the white, the supremacy, imperialism. But is that today that we're listening to all I'm, this? I'm thinking that it is refreshing to find them it's always with one collective voice. Prof. Yeah, Harriet, mm -hmm. you see, I mean, fine speeches. I mean, very good. Like you said, nice very refreshing, talk. nice talk, a nice try. And I've always maintained that this is not the first time we heard this course about reform at the UN. Mm -hmm. We even elected Kofi Annan before him, Brutus Brutus Ghali, as Africans to push that agenda. Prior to that, in the 1970s and 80s, we were calling for a new international economic order, where you used to have G77 mm -hmm. countries that were pushing for third world interests. Mm -hmm. You have the non aligned movement and mm -hmm. all that. So mm -hmm. this, is not, this is not new. You see, the point that Faru made that it struck me is you can't go to the IMF with both in hand, begging for $3 billion. Mm -hmm. And then you come back, and who, who, whose money is in the IMF and the World Bank? It's the same country. These are countries. And I've always maintained that a little bit of history is always important for our leaders before they go and make these uh, speeches. The, 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 the African Union have to recognize that the reform they are calling for if it has to happen, that would dismantle the UN as we know it. Because the Security Council was a compromise, was an incentive. The League of Nations couldn't succeed because the big powers like America didn't see any incentive. So Congress couldn't support President Wood Wood Wilson to be part. So in 1945, they have to use the Security Council as an incentive for the powerful countries to stay in the UN. So they are bringing something to the table. They are literally, America pays about 25% mm. of the UN budget. Even now they do, they How do much own. are we doing, African countries? What is our contribution? So it's not enough. You see, and, and when I always say that you, you go to the UN to ask for reform, then it means that you are misreading international relations that talk about national self-interest. The people who are benefiting from the current arrangement, do you think they willingly like to be reformed so that the thing will not benefit them again? No, it's, it's a wrong message. Because at the end of the day, the current structure, I mean, is good for some countries. It's working for some countries. Therefore, you cannot tell them to let go what is working for them. And because of the resources they are putting into these things. So until and unless we as a people have recognized that, look, these countries have been run to for economic assistance, for financial support. They are the ones running these same institutions. Therefore, the least we can do is to keep quiet. Unless we say that from now onwards, we mobilize resources among ourselves. Mm -hmm. Here we have our president talking about African beyond aid. 
as one of his flagship Pan African uh, Message. messages. And when he, he, he started talking, people believed him that here we have a leader who is not speaking a Pan Africanist language. The whole happened to that. He's Three been gone for seven, seven years. How has he actualized the African Beyond Aid agenda? Now you are leading the way in recolonizing literally the continent. Because see, when you go for the three billion dollars, there will be conditions. Conditions that will perpetuate the same. You are they talking are about considered as our partners for development. Partners. You see, I've told you that certain discourses, we shouldn't abuse them. Partnership is an accounting terminology that we borrow and use. When we talk about partnership, everybody comes to the table with something. Something equal asset to the table. So partnership discourse was smuggled into international development in the early 2000s just to deceive everybody that there, there's a reform of international aid. There's no partnership. When part we are partner, you are begging, you are the receiving end. Then, okay, so fine. If it's a partnership, we are getting $3 billion. What are the other partners getting from us? Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you try to get it? Because, Harry, Hati, yeah. it, is, it is not just... Mm. just a talk show we're mm. talking about mathematics and mm. accountability and accounting etc here mm. that mm. the african leaders all the time mm. when it comes to fine speeches mm. you will get to know that the european union the supermarket the superpowers or you're talking about the world powers america mm. their speeches are very short mm. the uk is their speeches are the unga united nations general assembly very short straight the australian is straight to the point <laughs> african leader comes descriptive very grammatized, well grammar, either French or English, and then, then they roll it out. They sit back comfortably and listen. Mm -hmm. Let's talk which continent has more of the blocks in the United Nations yeah. General Assembly. Yeah. It's not the African countries. Yeah. You have 56 yeah. in there. So if you have 56 in there, and you are not part, a permanent member of the United Nations uh, uh, Security. Security Council. So if America stands as one, United Kingdom has stands as one, France, China, Russia, and now India and Angkor are pushing agenda also to be part. Mm -hmm. I would have wished and thought that the African Union would have come out and said that we want also, we are also a superpower because we are 56 countries. Mm -hmm. We will not send Ghana to go and sit there for only two years. Mm -hmm. We will not send Dakar mm -hmm. or we will not send uh, uh, Banjul to go and sit there. Why African Union have not put themselves together? Mm -hmm. Then Nanado, then Ruto, then Ramaphosa will be dealing with the subject that now we are also choosing one, one African Union to have a permanent representative mm -hmm. on the UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Have they espoused that? Is that what they've discussed? They haven't done any of that. You always bring a Sierra Leone and there will be only two, two, one month or three months or two months that UN General Assembly, United, uh, uh, United Nations Security Council, Ghana chairs the United Nations Security Council. Mm -hmm. When they made a speech over the same Israel and Palestine, when they said that Pal Israelis should allow uh, uh, Palestine to, to have their country, what happened at the UN Security Council? Israel attacked Ghana. Mm -hmm. They came to Ghana and, and then opposed. But if it was an African Union speaking with one voice and a permanent member of the UN Security Council, we cannot speak and talk about these subjects that they are raising. Either than that, Ghana's trouble is not Malaysia, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, Kenya's trouble. Ghana's issue is not what uh, maybe Chad is looking at it. Ghana's issue is not to retire what we are looking at it. We are completely divided countries, divided economies, divided continent. We are not what we think we believe we are. It is not true. On paper, we have everything beautiful. But naturally, in practicality, is completely zero. All these talk shows will end nowhere. The worst thing, they haven't heard anything. Go and put your house in order and come back and let's debate. You can come with a plate and then be coming and to call the show. shots. You call it um, talk show. It's a talk show. Interesting. Um, our hub. Yeah. All right. So, let, gentlemen, let's move on to. So, yes, we still have our number displayed on our screen. So, you can join the conversation. I think I've been given two or three minutes to take your messages. So, even though we are still, you know, having our discussions here, you can also join in from wherever you are. 054 423 5984 displayed on our screen. So, you can, you know, join the conversation. Now, let's talk about a very Mm -hmm. A very what is the word I'm looking for? I, the way you controversial. You, use, you. use the I, word I controversial. controversial. Okay, you seem interesting. I, I, I think this is um, okay. a step in the right direction, yes. and I'm happy about it as an African, and of course I know you are also. Let's talk about Africa's visa-free policy mm. as part of the AU's Agenda 2063. Um, 
before I come to Faru, prof, <laughs> prof. <laughs> prof, prof, for me, yeah. when I hear African countries mm. opening up their borders, mm. relaxing mm. protocols, mm. Mm. urging or encouraging free movement mm. of people, mm. goods, you know, to mm. enhance mm. trade, commerce mm. um, on the continent, mm. promoting, talking about intra-African mm. trading mm. and all of that, I get excited because I think that um, mm. we are making some progress. Mm. It's, it's baby steps, mm. you know, but mm. we will get there. Mm. But to tell me about what you think about this whole move. Well, we are in the studio name after Kwame Nkrumah, right? Absolutely. So this is a Kwame Nkrumah studio. Right. I mean, honestly, if you talk about Pan-Africanism and the fact that African leaders are now catching up with their dream and vision of Kwame Nkrumah many, many years ago, mm -hmm. I'm all for that. I mean, the fact that they are, they've now come to the realization that these artificial borders mm -hmm. created by the colonialists have not helped the continent. Therefore, it's about time we started removing them and doing what is right. I'm all for that. But you see, Harry, the world has changed. The world has moved on. While we're lacking behind, not knowing what to do, the rest of the world had gone ahead of us. Mm -hmm. You travel to Europe, you get to the airport, and the European citizens, they are on different mm -hmm. distance. And then the others, and you see that the queues. It means that they, they got it long ago. We are now playing a catch-up. Unfortunately, the world has changed in the sense that there are a lot of security and other issues that would go against such a policy, if not carefully planned. It's not enough to say you are having visa-free. What measures are you putting in place in the respective countries? How are you going to make sure that anybody who is coming through with an African passport mm -hmm. is somebody who is not going to import trouble into your country. So before a country decides to implement such a policy, mm -hmm. they may have to do a lot of security and other checks that will ensure that in this age of terrorism and uh, insecurity, they are not worsening the plight of the ordinary people. So in as much as I'm all for it, it's mm -hmm. a Pan-Africanist movement, mm -hmm. it's, it's long overdue, we have to be sure. And for me, if we take the individual country, let's say Ghana, we have delayed because other countries have gone ahead of us which for me is, is uh, it's not good enough because we should have been the first to implement such a policy. Because President Mahama actually in his last State of the Union, a State of the Nation address, actually announced that. Yeah, but the president that, and the current administration yeah. recently announced that. No, I know. I'm, I know. That, you know. So when did Mahama leave office? When did he announce that? Yeah, 2016. Now we are in 20 what? Before we are better late than never. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making is that I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful or I'm hoping that would have taken into account our national economic and security interest. If that's the reason we delayed, then I want to believe that now that we are going to be rolling it out, there will not be any hitches. Because before you implement a policy, you need to do your homework, mm -hmm. making sure the policy does not end up causing more harm than good. That's how you implement a policy. So announcing the policy is one thing, actualizing and implementing it in the way you de de desire it is another thing. So that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Farouk. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah. here we are. What do you think about this well, move it, by it, it, it is a fine African countries? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ghana recently mm -hmm. also made um, the announcement. Mm -hmm. um, Ketsi, our president, mm -hmm. His Excellency Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, that beginning this year we are going to open our borders to the rest of the African countries, Very you nice. know, as part of the free movements, goods, and all of that. What okay. do you make of this? There are three subjects that have been discussed since the inception and the opening and the beginning, the foundation and formation of the African Union prior to that OAU, when Haley Selassie was the president and then followed by Kwame Nkrumah, already the originator of the African Union, was even not the first. Mm. So he was selfless on that score. So from day one, this free Africa movement, mm -hmm. or free movement of people on the continent of Africa, it was not to today, it was established. Leading to that, developed, time went on up to 2002, mm -hmm. when it was renamed African Union, mm -hmm. leaving the OAU. The African Union in Durban. At that time, President Tabo Mbiki, President Kofor, Muammar al-Gaddafi, mm -hmm. And then Abdul also like Abdul Wad, and then also uh, uh, Basanjo, mm -hmm. uh, Festus Mogai, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. 
that was the main topical issue. Gaddafi went further to say that mm -hmm. it is not even enough for us to use individual passport called the Ghana passport, mm -hmm. but rather we should have what is called African mm -hmm. Union passport. Mm -hmm. And that he even voluntarily mm -hmm. said he will use Libyan's excess resources to fund and funding that kind of a project. Mm -hmm. So all Africa must use one passport. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? They did three things. Mm -hmm. Not only the free movement, as they are, they are trying to say. Right right of establishment of enterprises business and corporations cooperatives mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. and then also there should be a third right of residence mm -hmm. right of residence means that a Ghanaian holding a ghana passport mm -hmm. can go to nigeria mm -hmm. i am still an african mm -hmm. have access to establish my own business my enterprise and start to trade mm -hmm. then one can also go to nigeria that i've decided to come and live in nigeria mm -hmm. because i like the women of nigeria they are fine women or like Ghanaian. I want to live here and live here and marry here. So right of residence should not be a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. What do we see and here do we see? What do we see here? What they are talking about announcing the, 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 the free movement, Ghana has opened the door. Mm -hmm. Yes, bingo, we've done our part. Ghana has done well. But let us go into the nitty gritty. The fact that you are opening them to come to travel through, mm -hmm. to come and do tourism or to come and tour or to, mm -hmm. to swipe and go through, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. People go to countries based on interest. Mm -hmm. What are the interests? Tourism interests, mm -hmm. marital interests, business interests, etc. Mm -hmm. So coming in here to spend 90 days, is that what we are talking about? No. I may be tempted to live in the country. What next? That is where African Union and all this talk fall short. Mm -hmm. Because what? Mm -hmm. I want to live here. I don't have right of residence. I have free movement to put, pass through. Is that what we need? No. European Union has shown us the way, even though we are older than them. Mm -hmm. That for them is not only free movement traveling from Andorra to Petersburg, mm -hmm. but rather be able to enter any territorial zones of the European Union and be able to apply to stay, mm -hmm. right of residence, mm -hmm. to establish business, right of establishment, and then also to have free movement. Mm -hmm. Is that not it? Mm -hmm. So if you are in Paris and you want to go as far as to Tébéré in Spain, you don't have any police barrier on the way mm -hmm. anywhere that they stop you that you are belgic citizen mm -hmm. drop etc mm -hmm. this african union and free movement that we're talking about mm -hmm. we are happy talking about visa or free visa it is even not true the reason is that egypt they have failed to sign their part mm -hmm. algeria morocco libya other countries more than 30 African countries, or let's say strictly about 25 countries but in some Africa. African Relax. Have started? Relax. Yes, mm -hmm. if they started, mm -hmm. what have they started? We bring that to a core topic you don't want us to discuss. Mm -hmm. We have a beautiful topic of Ghana, South Africa, free movement mm -hmm. called the visa waiver. Right. Visa waiver is 90 days. Is that all what? No. 90 days, South Africa to that extent, which was part where the free movement agreement reached, was reached in Durban. Devon Biki was the one sitting as a president at that time. When after that thing was signed, Ghana came back and allowed Africans, some Africans, except Eritrea, some countries, Chad, terrorists, maybe branded countries, cannot come to Ghana and access visa at the airport. Mm -hmm. But almost generally, everybody could apply for visa at the airport on entry. Mm -hmm. What do we see? Egypt embassies, they know, go to Egyptian embassy for them to screen you. Morocco does the same thing. What about South Africa? They, they were the, the, the policy was made mm. did not until when until two months ago mm. and then what kind of visa waiver they have with ghana they did not the international visa waiver is 90 days mm. if you want to live bef beyond that as an african union we should talk about the right of residence or right of establishment mm. is that what they are doing south africa went as far as hitting the ghana signing agreement of cumulative 90 days of visa waiver what does it mean what is does it make in diplomacy it means that 90 days i should spread if i go first time 10 days 20 days 10 days and put all together when it's 90 days i don't have the right to come yeah. unless i go and apply is that what the free movement means is that what the, the waiver says there's no waiver meaning that the central african republics cameroon gabon brazzaville Bongi, Central African Republic, Brazzaville, Congo, Congo DR, and then coming all the way up to Angola. All of them, Rwanda, etc., each one of them take visas to under, enter the other one. And we are talking about free movement. Mm. How does a Cameroonese take visa to Gabon? How can a Ghanaian we take visa to enter Cameroon? Have they already eliminated that one? So the free waiver 
It is some countries by countries that have agreed. Mm. Kenya relaxed years to Ghanaians. Mm. Ghanaians mm. relaxed mm. ours. Mm. And then, etc. But more of the countries on the Africans, till today, they do not agree. Put the free movement aside as a visa waiver. What about the interblocks? Border, the patrol, barriers. police, mm. barrier. Whereas I should use my car and be able to drive from Accra to Lagos, the distance should not cover more than five hours. Mm. But I spent 11 to 12 to 16 hours. Mm. Why? Because even within my own country, Accra, by the time I reach Jerusalem Gate in Pram Pram, mm. and then drive up to Aflao, from Aflao to Lakoji, Lakoji to Seme, Seme, to Badagri up to Lagos, mm. you face more than 300 blocks. Mm. Is that a free movement then? There's no free movement. Mm. So free movement as the Europeans, mm. they did what you could, a maintaining of free border, mm. and maintaining free movement of people proper. Mm. Not telling me that there's a free movement prof. Mm. But then, of course, when I sit in the car, mm. Cote d'Ivoire police stops his any Ghana number plate. Mm. You have to drop. Everybody comes. Passport. Meanwhile, you've gone through immigration of no way. Stamped in already, mm. legally. But they collect your passport and put it, custom officer says on your passport and bring money before. Is that free movement? So for me, mm -hmm. all these talk shows, I will still always hate the African Union and the interbox, mm -hmm. the blocks within the African country, the African Union, the Central Africans, the South African, the North and the West and the East African, the ECOWAS, etc. Mm -hmm. We are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And if we do not do enough, it will also need help and support this after program mm -hmm. or the project that they seek to do it will not uh, succeed mm -hmm. so african union we must be the african countries mm -hmm. must emulate the standards of what the europeans have done mm -hmm. and if we are talking about free movement it does not only restrict itself by only traveling through the country yeah. for three months how there many africans have money to go on there? To there should be more the mm -hmm. three should be added as it was established yeah. free establishment mm -hmm. and then also right mm -hmm. Of, of residents. Yeah. That is what you are talking about. We are united country. Right. We have a long way to go, but we have to start from somewhere. So baby steps, I mean, I know you are talking out of passion because you want us to speed things up and, you know, in 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 the Africa that we all aspire to have. So at the end of the day, it is good that we criticize ourselves and then we also find ways of moving forward and getting better. But so I'm wrapping up. But yesterday, let me mention something very nice happened and i'm excited about it because one um i know that women are highly underrepresented in many 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 you know areas and so for me when i see another woman climbing the ladder and you know persevering and giving her best i really would like to be part of you know that space and um, i'm talking about this with regard to our foreign affairs minister um honorable shelley ayokobo chase um um, who announced yesterday that she's been nominated by the president of Ghana. And so she announced her candidacy for the um, Commonwealth Secretary Generalship, right? And you were there. Yes. So that's okay. some good news. Yes. You had the opportunity to interact briefly yes, with her. It was a great, uh, a great show. The lecture was very superb. I told her myself that she did a good lecture. Mm. And I prayed that what she's really actually laid out or what she ruled out mm. and then her speeches and lecture let it be and i believe that with our african union collectively behind her mm. and then also back home locally and domestic politics mm. the opposition the biggest opposition party says that they're in support because of course she's a Ghanaian. Right. that is a good thing mm. i believe and i do hope that yes it is possible that she'll be able to be the successor of a Samuel a, a, a person. So if she wins, mm. then it will be Ghana another wins. Ghana wins. All right. But then if she wins, all things that she said mm. yesterday, in fact, she should try and do it. Commonwealth right. is bleeding. All right. So thank you so much. Um, I'm Farouk Al Wahab, international diplomatic consultant. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Professor Lord Mauko Yevuga, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. We really appreciate your expertise on all the various subjects that we discussed on this show. My name is Harriet Nate, and it's always a pleasure to have you join us on this show. I look forward to seeing you same time next week. Enjoy the rest of our programs.
Your favorite social service program is Mark. Cocaine. Pure cocaine is unaddictive. What is addictive is when it's adulterated. People don't even know that that is the status of the law. The fact that when you are raped, you can justifiably walk into any, any government hospital or a licensed medical facility for an abortion. Join the Law Express panel for relevant, informative, and educative topics week after week after week.